TradeMoneyATM.com. Chapter 1 of The Art of Money Getting This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston The Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum Chapter 1 Don't Mistake Your Vocation The safest plan, and the one most sure of success for the young man starting in life, is to select the vocation which is most congenial to his tastes. Parents and guardians are often quite too negligent in regard to this. It's very common for a father to say, for example, I have five boys. I will make Billy a clergyman, John a lawyer, Tom a doctor, and Dick a farmer. He then goes into town and looks about to see what he will do with Sammy. He returns home and says, Sammy, I see watchmaking is a nice genteel business. I think I will make you a goldsmith. He does this, regardless of Sam's natural inclinations or genius. We are all, no doubt, born for a wise purpose. There is as much diversity in our brains as in our countenances. Some are born natural mechanics, while some have great aversion to machinery. Let a dozen boys of ten years get together, and you will soon observe two or three are whittling out some ingenious device, working with locks or complicated machinery. When they were but five years old, their father could find no toy to please them like a puzzle. They are natural mechanics, but the other eight or nine boys have different aptitudes. I belong to the latter class. I never had the slightest love for mechanism. On the contrary, I have a sort of abhorrence for complicated machinery. I never had ingenuity enough to whittle a cider tap so it would not leak. I never could make a pen that I could write with or understand the principle of a steam engine. If a man was to take such a boy as I was, and attempt to make a watchmaker of him, the boy might, after an apprenticeship of five or seven years, be able to take a part and put together a watch. But all through life he would be working uphill and seizing every excuse for leaving his work and idling away his time. Watchmaking is repulsive to him. Unless a man enters upon the vocation intended for him by nature and best suited to his peculiar genius, he cannot succeed. I am glad to believe that the majority of persons do find their right vocation, yet we see many who have mistaken their calling, from the blacksmith up, or down, to the clergyman. You will see, for instance, that extraordinary linguist, the learned blacksmith, who ought to have been a teacher of languages, and you may have seen lawyers, doctors, and clergymen who were better fitted by nature for the anvil or the lapstone. End of Chapter 1. Recording by Jill Preston. TradeMoneyATM.com Chapter 2 of The Art of Money Getting. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston The Art of Money Getting by P. T. Barnum Chapter 2 Select the Right Location After securing the right vocation, you must be careful to select the proper location. You may have been cut out for a hotel keeper, and they say it requires a genius to know how to keep a hotel. You might conduct a hotel like clockwork and provide satisfactorily for 500 guests every day. Yet, if you should locate your house in a small village where there is no railroad communication or public travel, the location would be your ruin. It is equally important that you do not commence business where there are already enough to meet all demands in the same occupation. I remember a case which illustrates this subject. When I was in London in 1858, I was passing down Holborn with an English friend and came to the penny shows. 
they had immense cartoons outside portraying the wonderful curiosities to be seen all for a penny being a little in the show line myself i said let us go in here we soon found ourselves in the presence of the illustrious showman and he proved to be the sharpest man in that line i had ever met he told us some extraordinary stories in reference to his bearded ladies his albinos and his armadillos which we could hardly believe but thought it better to believe it than look after the proof he finally begged to call our attention to some wax statuary and showed us a lot of the dirtiest and filthiest wax figures imaginable they looked as if they had not seen water since the deluge what is there so wonderful about your statuary i asked i beg you not to speak so satirically he replied sir these are not madame tussaud's wax figures all covered with glit and tinsel in imitation diamonds and copied from engravings and photographs mine sir were taken from life whenever you look upon one of those figures you may consider that you are looking upon the living individual glancing casually at them i saw one labeled henry eight and feeling a little curious upon seeing that it looked like calvin edson the living skeleton i said do you call that henry the eighth he replied certainly sir it was taken from life at hampton court by special order of his majesty on such a day he would have given the hour of the day if i had resisted i said everybody knows that henry eight was a great stout old king and that figure is lean and lank what do you say to that why he replied you would be lean and lank yourself if you sat there as long as he has there was no resisting such arguments i said to my english friend let us go out do not tell him who i am i show the white feather he beats me he followed us to the door and seeing the rabble in the street he called out ladies and gentlemen i beg to draw your attention to the respectable character of my visitors pointing to us as we walked away. I called upon him a couple of days afterwards, told him who I was, and said, My friend, you are an excellent showman, but you have selected a bad location. He replied, This is true, sir. I feel that all my talents are thrown away, but what can I do? You can go to America, I replied. You can give full play to your faculties over there. You will find plenty of elbow room in America. I will engage you for two years. After that, you will be able to go on your own account. He accepted my offer and remained two years in my New York Museum. He then went to New Orleans and carried on a traveling show business during the summer. Today, he is worth $60,000 simply because he selected the right vocation and also secured the proper location. The old proverb says, Three removes are as bad as a fire, but when a man is in the fire, it matters but little how soon or how often he removes. End of chapter 2 Recording by Jill Preston Chapter 3 of the art of money getting this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jill preston the art of money getting by p t barnum chapter 3 avoid debt Young men starting in life should avoid running into debt. There is scarcely anything that drags a person down like debt. It is a slavish position to get in, yet we find many a young man, hardly out of his teens, running in debt. He meets a chum and says, Look at this. I have got trusted for a new suit of clothes. He seems to look upon the clothes as so much given to him. 
Well, it frequently is so, but if he succeeds in pain and then gets trusted again, he is adopting a habit which will keep him in poverty through life. Debt robs a man of his self-respect and makes him almost despise himself. Grunting and groaning and working for what he has eaten up or worn out, and now when he is called upon to pay up, he has nothing to show for his money. This is properly termed working for a dead horse. I do not speak of merchants buying and selling on credit or of those who buy on credit in order to turn the purchase to a profit. The old Quaker said to his farmer's son, John, never get trusted, but if thee gets trusted for anything, let it be for manure, because that will help thee pay it back again. Mr. Beecher advised young men to get in debt if they could to a small amount in the purchase of land in the country districts. If a young man, he says, will only get in debt for some land and then get married, these two things will keep him straight, or nothing will. This may be safe to a limited extent, but getting in debt for what you eat and drink and wear is to be avoided. Some families have a foolish habit of getting credit at the stores and thus frequently purchase many things which might have been dispensed with. It is all very well to say, I have got trusted for 60 days, and if I don't have the money, the creditor will think nothing about it. There is no class of people in the world who have such good memories as creditors. When the 60 days run out, you will have to pay. If you do not pay, you will break your promise, and probably resort to a falsehood. You may make some excuse or get in debt elsewhere to pay it, but that only involves you the deeper. A good-looking, lazy young fellow, who was the apprentice boy, Horatio, his employer said, Horatio, did you ever see a snail? I think I have, he drawled out. You must have met him then, for I am sure you never overtook one, said the boss. Your creditor will meet you or overtake you and say, Now, my young friend, you agreed to pay me, you have not done it. You must give me your note. You give the note on interest and it commences working against you. It is a dead horse. The creditor goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning better off than when he retired to bed because his interest has increased during the night. But you grow poorer while you are sleeping for the interest is accumulating against you. Money is in some respects like fire. It is a very excellent servant but a terrible master. When you have it mastering you, when interest is constantly piling up against you, it will keep you down in the worst kind of slavery. But let money work for you, and you have the most devoted servant in the world. It is no I servant. There is nothing animate or inanimate that will work so faithfully as money when placed at interest well secured. It works night and day and in wet or dry weather. I was born in the blue law state of Connecticut, where the old Puritans had laws so rigid that it was said they fined a man for kissing his wife on Sunday. Yet these rich old Puritans would have thousands of dollars at interest, and on Saturday night would be worth a certain amount. On Sunday they would go to church and perform all the duties of a Christian. On waking up on Monday morning, they would find themselves considerably richer than the Saturday night previous simply because their money placed at interest had worked faithfully for them all day Sunday, according to law. Do not let it work against you. If you do, there is no chance for success in life so far as money is concerned. John Randolph, the eccentric Virginian, once exclaimed in Congress, Mr. Speaker, I have discovered the philosopher's stone. Pay as you go. This is, indeed, nearer to the philosopher's stone than any alchemist has ever yet arrived. End of chapter three. Recording by Jill Preston. TradeMoneyATM.com